This conference will now be recorded. Call the meeting in order. First order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. Stand, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. First order of business is over. The only order of business is workshop with regard to the great study that has been done. Tony, I'll turn it to you and or Rick as the case may be and we'll go from there. Hey, thank you Mr. Chairman. Just a reminder everybody this is a workshop so it's kind of informal. Um, as Mr. Beaumont just correctly stated that this is the only order of business this evening that and adjourning at the end. Um, we've already spoke with Mayhew about this and the Workshop is, in essence, he's going to walk us through the slides of the presentation, but feel free to ask questions at any time about what's being presented. We don't need to save them up till the end. Um, I meant to formally introduce Mayhew C.V., a, uh, a principal and longtime consultant at, uh, at PLM, who's, uh, who's done this work, prepared this uh, great study, and um, like I said, the, the, the workshop is his presentation as he walks us through the, uh, the slide deck, and I want to, well, that's just it, I'll turn it over to Tony before we let Mayhew get underway. Yeah, so I just wanted to thank everybody, one, for sure, for coming. Um, to the presentation and uh, specifically thank uh, Mayhew and Brian for all their hard work uh, to date. Um, it's been a, a lot of work uh, went into the preparing for tonight's presentation. Um, Mayhew uh, has significant experience uh, in the region, within this, this region, uh, putting these uh, types of presentations together. So. Um, I look forward to it and uh, hope you all enjoy it. Get through all your questions. Maybe I believe I set you up to be the presenter if you want to bring the, the presentation up. All right, let me, uh, let, me uh, let me see how this works. Okay. Uh, okay. Hmm. Ah, there we go. All right, can people see that? I think he's going to put it to full screen. Okay. Looks good. Looks good. Okay. okay. So, thank, uh, good evening. Good to good to be able to present. I wish I could see there in person. Uh, yeah, a little background. I've been uh, I've been doing rate design, cost of service analysis for public power utilities in New England for oh about thirty years. Uh, made many many presentations to municipal light commissions. And uh, so, hopefully, hopefully we can do this in a way that will uh, will answer any questions that you have. Um, since I don't really know what people's sort of baseline of familiarity is with cost of service principles, I've started this out with a little bit of an introduction on how we go about doing this. So hopefully, hopefully I'm not telling you a lot of things you already know. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to first talk about principles of cost of service and rate design. Then I'm going to go over the results of the fiscal 19 historic test year cost of service study. I'm going to then go over the results of the five-year financial projection, look at some possible scenarios for rates over the next five years and questions and feedback but uh, hopefully hopefully we'll be have space 
throughout the evening for you to ask questions while they're still fresh. Uh, so jumping right in, uh, I'm going to talk about the objectives of rate design. I'm going to talk about cost allocation, and then I'm going to talk about the rate design process. Can you hear you there? Uh, can you hear me? Did I, I can hear and see you. Have you lost? Yeah, we got you back here. I, I'm not sure what happened. Oh, okay. Where did the... Uh, where did you lose me? Pretty much about the time you went to this slide. Okay. All right then. Uh, so I'm gonna talk through the objectives of rate design. I'm gonna talk through the process of cost allocation and then the process of actually designing rates. What I see as the major objectives of rate design are to produce rates that are adequate, fair, competitive, stable, and clear. Adequacy means that your revenues should cover your operating expenses and produce enough to fund the renewal and expansion of the plant so that you can continue to provide reliable service. Uh, we measure this by the overall rate of return on investment and you have a statutory guideline of between five and eight percent on in terms of what you can earn as a rate of return and that's on your on your as a percentage of your net uh, depreciated plant value second objective fairness uh, the rate paid by each class of customer should reflect as closely as accurately as possible the cost of providing service to that class of customer and to that end, we calculate the, in addition to the overall rate of return, we look at individual customer class rates of return. And may you, I wanna just stop right now and quickly compliment you on that approach. I have found that that, that idea, which does run through your whole study, is the unique thing we obtained by ensuring that we would get a fresh set of eyes and a fresh perspective when, when the electric division did this this time. As you might imagine, often if you don't overtly try to do that, you always end up with the same, the same people because their presentations are going to be the best because they've got the experience with you. They've got a leg up cost, comp competitively and their knowledge of their your system is so strong it, it's hard then for a for a system to end up awarding a bid to somebody other than who's done it for them in the past and by it by setting up the bid such that we ensured that we would have somebody else i like the um this new approach this different approach that, that you provide Hey, thank you. Good to hear that. Uh, the next thing we look at is competitiveness. Hey, uh, you will excuse us, maybe hey, hey, Patrick Brady. I'm one of the members of the commission. I just want to just want to understand your your comment, Mr. Hendershot. Is it your view that at the beginning of our rate making process five years ago, um, this 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 same theme was not present? The idea of rates of return by class is a new concept. Today. Rates of return by class. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Not overall. No, that's always been sort of a one of the benchmarks of an overall study. But, okay. but, to, but to refine the, the data parsing and and to do it by class is a to me a novel concept. Yeah. Would agree that rate, the rate of return by class I've not seen. I did not see it the last time. Uh, Omar, I'm, I'm another one of the commissioners. Comment I would make is that really for the, the this is the third design rate design in which we've tried to go ahead and uh, get the costs to be allocated more equitably, perhaps than they have been in the past. This particular one is you know take, takes it a step beyond what we've ever done before, uh, and I certainly commend you. 
for your approach with regard to that. All right, shall we proceed? Yes, sir. The next, uh, the, the next objective is competitiveness. We would like the cost of energy to each customer be competitive with the cost of energy paid by comparable customers to other energy providers in your immediate vicinity. To that end, we use typical bill comparisons to, uh, to make that uh, comparison. Uh, another objective is stability. We would like the average cost of energy paid by any customer not to fluctuate excessively from month to month or year to year. Uh, we look at the monthly fluctuations caused by changes in the uh, power, power cost adjustment, uh, and, and in your case, using a semi-annual adjustment really minimizes the impact of fluctuations in power costs. Uh, you also don't use seasonal rates, so any fluctuations are the semi-annual or annual fluctuations caused by base rate changes and changes in power cost. Uh, we aim for clarity. We would like the rate and its individual components to be easily understood by the customer. And the, you would like the customer to be able to verify their bill with a minimum of effort. Uh, and when we try to measure clarity, I just say, you know it when you see it. Uh, and, and it is not, say, an Eversource bill. It's uh, probably much more like one of your bills. Thank you. Uh, this is Patrick Bernie again. Um, again. We haven't discussed rates uh, in five years. It's been five years, right? Yep. Five uh, years. I think so. Yeah. So um, the, the concept, and, and I probably asked this question five years ago, and, and uh, Mr. Adair probably set me straight. This concept of not using seasonal rates was that a, was that part of sort of your directive? Don't use seasonal rates. Is there, was there could there have been some type of analysis that you provided us that um, that could have used a, a seasonal rate methodology? Uh, the uh, the rationale behind. Well, really, Ben, all rate making is that rates ought to reflect cost. If there are major seasonal variations in cost, then it makes sense to have seasonal rates. Uh, in the markets, the, the power markets in New England for the last decade or so, there had been far less seasonal variation in the cost of power. Uh, to the point where uh, I, I don't personally know of any utilities that still use seasonal rates. The regulated utilities have been uh, encouraged to stop having seasonal rates uh, quite a while ago, and you know, eventually the public power systems follow suit. <clears throat> yeah, we tried them for a while, the idea being that we understood that our peaks occurred in the summer, and did it make sense to seasonalize to send higher price signals in the summer to encourage customer behavior in a way that would reduce demand at the peak times? Right, and and and, and there's a lot of ra there's rationale for reducing. Uh, demand during peak periods, but a seasonal rate is a blunt instrument for accomplishing that uh, because That's what we learned. And um, we found them cumbersome and um, not effective. So we did reach a point, at least the study prior to this one, maybe two before this one, two before this one, where we, we decided. We don't want to do this any longer. Thank you. All right. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is cost allocation. And we start out with the concept of revenue requirements. Uh, the, the, the utility needs to, uh, needs to uh, produce a certain amount of revenue in order to cover uh, expenses. And so that's the, that, that's the revenue requirement. And 
we then allocate expenses across uh, the different customer classes on the basis of three principal factors, customers, demand, and energy. Uh, customer allocation factors are used for costs that are related to the number of customers rather than the, the amount of energy that the customer consumes. Examples of costs that we allocate using a customer allocation factor are your metering and billing expenses, your customer accounts expenses, the, the costs of, uh, of installing and maintaining services, uh, and, and, and a few other relatively minor costs are allocated on the basis of customer count. Uh, we used to just have one demand allocation factor, but now we have two. Uh, the distribution demand is applied to costs that are related to the maximum rate at which the customer uses energy, reflecting the size of the facilities that are required to serve that customer. Uh, and costs that are allocated on the basis of a distribution demand are uh, lines, transformers, uh, a, a good part of your uh, distribution expense is is really demand related. It's not all that connected to the amount of electricity that's being carried over those lines at any given time. Uh, we also have now a demand allocation for capacity and transmission costs because those costs are billed to you on the basis of your monthly and annual uh, demand during the hour of the grid or the transmission system peak. So your cost of transmission uh, from Eversource is a, a function of what you, how much you're using during the hour each month when they have the peak load on their transmission system. Not necessarily the time that you have your peak demand. So this is a, a relatively new factor. It's It's been there for a long time, but the dollars involved have soared in the last decade. So we, you, we allocate forward capacity costs and network transmission costs using uh, a coincident, what we call a coincident demand allocator, the, the load that each class is putting on the system during that peak hour each month. And finally, we use an energy allocation for costs that are related solely to the amount of energy uh, consumed by the customer. And what we really, the only cost that's allocated that way are purchased energy charges. We do, we do slightly weight that because all energy is not equal in terms of cost. Uh, you have energy costs that can be higher during the summer and winter, uh, higher during uh, weekday peak periods, so we try to reflect that in the energy allocation, but uh, by and large, it's a straight kilowatt hour allocation. So the next step that I'm going to talk about is the historic test year cost of service study. This is the really the first step in doing rate design. We take a full historic year worth of data, expenses, plant, customer usage and demand, and then we allocate the costs to each rate class using the allocation factors. Uh, we, calcu we calculate the revenues that each class produces within the model, and we compare those to the expenses allocated to those classes to determine how much net income you're earning from each class of customer and therefore the rate of return that each class of customer produces. The next step, once we've determined that, once, we've ha once we have a, a basic functioning cost of service model uh, using historic data where we can verify a lot of the things like revenues, we then look forward a year to uh, pro forma future test year, which where we take a budget numbers in place of the of the actual numbers. And we then use that model to 
determine the impact of changes in rate design. So if we want to <clears throat> start moving towards uniform rates of return, we start out looking at what would the present rates produce in this future year, and then what would happen if we made changes to the rate design. We then use that modeling to develop rate designs that will uh, produce adequate revenues, fund your capital improvements and your payment in lieu of taxes. And you also want designs that send clear and correct price signals to your customers. If I may, Bob uh, Goldman again, uh, you know, this is going to be, as far as sending correct price signals, et cetera, that is going to become even more important as time goes on, as we develop electric vehicle rates, as far as the, you know, as far as charging rates, possibly at some point in the future, uh, considering time of day rates, et cetera, to perhaps as a means of uh, providing electric char charging rates. But that that's in the future, but this is something that will become more and more important as time goes on. Yes, I, I, I agree. And one of the one of the advantages that we have now uh, with uh, with advances in computer and metering technology is we have uh, uh, potentially we have access to much more data in very granular detail uh, on, about the usage of individual, even down to individual customers that we can use not only to d design rates, but also to uh, target those price signals to the customers and give them the ability to control their costs. Uh, and we'll, we, we can talk more about that. Uh, the rate design is a, is a balancing act. You're typically balancing competing mutually exclusive objectives. Uh, and those are uniform rates of return. You would like, you would ideally like all of the classes to produce, be producing the same amount of income. You would like them all to be equally competitive. And you would also like any rate changes to be reasonably uniform for each class of customer. Uh, you can't have all three of these typically, so you need to balance them against each other. Uh, because each one of these objectives produces a different rate design, which has a different impact on each customer class. The next step beyond an initial rate design for a single future test year is to look out uh, into the future beyond that first year to determine, are these rates going to be sustainable for a longer period of time over a longer horizon. Uh, this, is, this has been relatively new, uh, at least for the work that I've been doing, but it's been extremely helpful to produce uh, you know, a five-year projection of in revenue expenses and plant to forecast not only the overall rate of return, but now to forecast what the individual class rates of return will be over time as some of the cost factors change. Uh, it also gives you the ability to project your operating cash balances and make sure that you have adequate revenues to fund your capital program. And once you have a tool like this in place, you can then develop a long-term rate strategy. Uh, for meeting your requirements over a five-year time horizon. So at that point, this would be a good point to stop and see if there's any questions before we delve into the details of Wallingford's uh, cost of service. No, Mayhew, it looks like we're good, so go ahead. All right. So we, uh, we, we built this on uh, fiscal 2019 base period. So we pulled together billing determinants, which are the, num the customer num number of customers, the kilowatt hours, and the kilowatts of demand. Uh, we compiled from your billing data from the second half of 2018 and the first half of 2019. Uh, we consolidated those into the eight rate classes that we modeled, uh, and we'll We'll, we'll see those uh, in, in detail in a bit. 
uh, and we didn't do we didn't make any any further adjustments uh, after we consolidated those into those into the eight customer classes that represent 99.8 percent of the revenues uh, we then multiply we multiply those billing units by the individual components of the rate to derive rate revenue so we build up the rate revenue from the bottom up uh, multiply customer counts by customer charge, kilowatt hours sold by kilowatt hour charges, KW demand by KW demand charges to calculate what the rate revenues should have been for that test year. And then we compare it to the actual revenues that you reported. And in this case, uh, we met our goal. The overall calculated rate revenues were within $300,000 or four tenths of a percent of the revenues that were reported in your uh, in internal uh, documents. And individual class revenues were also all within one and a half uh, percent of what was actually reported. So that gives us confidence that the model will project revenues accurately when we look at at future periods we calculated that we we then uh, adjusted the rate revenues to reflect other operating revenues and other income and <clears throat> those we allocated across the different customer classes on the basis of rate revenues so if if residential customers accounted for 40% of the rate revenue, then they get allocated 40% of the non-rate revenue, just as a, as a way of accounting for those costs. Because a lot of things like interest costs and other costs are not really allocable. The allocation factors that we used were uh, derived from uh, billing units that, from your system, as well as load shape data. Uh, I don't believe we actually used national grid data. Uh, I, I think at the, in the end we used Eversource data, but all of those, all of the utilities now publish uh, detailed customer class load shape data on their websites that are there for the purpose of uh, providing information for competitive retail suppliers who supply energy to their retail customers. Uh, Excuse me, mate. Yeah. Rick, yes, Rick. Rick, Rick Hendershot here. Um, in a discussion outside of this workshop, you and I were talking about this, and I believe you told me that the load shape data you used was Eversource Connecticut. That's right. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 you know, in general, uh, for classes of smaller customers like residential and small commercial, where you have a large number of customers, a pretty homogeneous uh, customer base. Those load shapes are, are, are correlate very highly to yours. Uh, when you get to the much larger customer customer classes, primarily your primary class where you have the, the very large customers, those customers can be a little bit unique. So you have to, I, I don't, you know, and, until you have actually uh, acquired hourly data for your own customers. We're just going to have to continue to use borrowed data, but that's the way that's the way it goes. <clears throat> so we uh, we compiled it. We generally use about twenty or thirty allocation factors. Uh, they fall into the general category of demand, customer, and energy, as we uh, as we discussed before. Oh, uh, lost. Am I? Have you, am I am I am I there? Yeah, yeah, you're back. You just about, we lost you when you talked about the number of allocation factors used. Wow. Okay. So we use a lot of allocation factors. They 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 fall into three general categories. Uh, demand allocator. Th what's important here is that demand related expenses uh, amount to about sixty percent of your total operating expenses. Uh, customer related uh, less than ten percent. And the rest is is energy. I've, I've provided an example here of uh, of how costs get allocated, uh, and the example I'm using here is capacity costs, forward capacity costs, which is uh, what you pay 
ISO New England for uh, your share of the capacity that New England needs to provide reliable service during all hours of the year. Those are allocated on the basis of your contribution to the New England regional annual peak demand, which is usually in July or August. Uh, we use those customer load shapes to determine what each class of customer contributes to that annual peak. Residential customers are a higher percentage of the load in that peak hour than they are on average. And that's shown down below. Residential customers are 37.5% of the total kilowatt hours, but they're nearly 50% of the load during the New England peak hour, at least in the in fiscal 19 when we did the analysis. Uh, so when we allocate all of the capacity costs on the basis of this, this line here, the share of the load in the peak hour, this is how much capacity cost gets allocated to the four main classes, the residential, the small general service, the large general service, and the primary customers. Uh, when we divide those capacity costs by the number of kilowatt hours sold in the year to each of those classes, you can see that it costs you four and a half cents to provide capacity to a residential customer and only two and a half cents. Use the stop for a moment. Hold on. Can you hear us now? Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't, I haven't lost your audio at all. So can you hear, you get me now? You can hear now. So we got, we're having intermittent dropouts. If, if somebody could, if Rick, if you can start waving your hand when you, when you can't hear me, that'd be so, so I know. Uh, what I was saying was it costs four and a half cents f to provide the capacity for a typical residential customer uh, for each kilowatt hour that they use during mm -hmm. the year and only two and a half cents for a large primary metered customer. So there are big differences. Uh, and this il illustrates this visually. Uh, the red bar is the the peak hour for uh, which would have been let's say if it's fiscal 19 it would have been the summer of 2018. Uh, no, actually this is 2019. No, okay, it's different example, but uh, July 29th, 2019 that was the peak for for uh, for 2019, and hour 18 was the peak hour, and you can see that that's right during the hour when residential customers are using the most electricity. Whereas when you go to small general service customers, they peak around midday and their load is starting to go down at six o'clock in the, in the afternoon. Similarly, large general and primary, you know, large businesses, uh, their load is starting to go down. Uh, so the, the light blue bar shows where that, where the peak was occurring uh, just what 2016, just uh, just five years ago, the the peak demand has moved much later in the day over the last five years because of the amount of behind the meter solar generation that's taking place. It reduces the a, a lot of utilities load during the main daylight hours, centering around you know one or two in the afternoon. And that load starts to build up again at, as as the sun goes down. So the the New England load has been gradually moving later in the day, uh, and as a result, more and more of these capacity and transmission costs are being allocated towards residential customers and away from uh, large users of electricity. May you, uh, this is Patrick Graham, a member of the commission. I, I was with you through 25 slides, and then this was the slide that I was looking at, and just, I just really didn't fully appreciate it, and I didn't appreciate um, the comparison to 2016, which, based on the large font over on the left column, it looks like that's a 
material change over those three years. So can you just walk me through this again? And I, I, I understand this is in the, I believe this is in the context of capacity, but if you could just sort of walk us through these four tables, the, the light blue, the red, and just again, reiterate what the point is you're trying to make for me a neophyte on this issue. Okay, uh, if you imagine that there's some large amount of, of capacity cost, uh, looks like it's probably close to $20 million that you incur, and, and that cost is incurred in one hour in the year. Uh, that, that, the, the load on, in your system during that hour uh, is what determines how much you as a utility pay for capacity for the next 12 months, and also, therefore, what your customers are going to pay. Now, if you want to, if you want to allocate those $20 million to your customers, you're going to allocate it on the basis of what they were using during that hour. And you can see that uh, the residential customers are using a much higher percentage of that electricity during hour 18 than they would have been if that peak had occurred in hour 15 the way it used to. Uh, the largest contributor would, contributors would have been your very large customers. They used to drive the peak load during the day when capacity costs were, uh, were being built, and, and that's no longer the case they are causing less of the peak than they used to, and the residential customers are causing more of the peak than they used to. Huh. Interesting. And for some of the reasons that you stated earlier, uh, solar, for example. Yes, yeah, solar is the is the main reason. If you look at if you look at first of all just the hour that the peak occurs. Uh, it, it, it used to be as early as, as two in the afternoon, uh, and, and now it's consistently six and even sometimes seven in the evening in the summertime. And, th and that's because that's when the sun's starting to go down and the solar generation is disappearing. And also, of course, residential customers are coming home and they're starting to turn on their lights and they're starting to cook dinner and and their electricity usage is peaking right about that time. Yeah, they come home and turn on the air conditioners. The large offices and, and businesses, the employees have left, the heat loads dropped off in the buildings and the air conditioners are slowing down or maybe even stop it because- Yeah, the they, right. You know, if they're using energy management systems, they're, 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 they're gonna ramp those ACs down as soon as there aren't bodies in the building. Yeah. So. So uh, now we'll just walk through where the uh, where the costs are in the cost of service model. Uh, we allocate uh, purchase power, transmission, distribution, and customer accounts and billing expenses. We allocate those all across the customer. Uh, uh, classes. We then take your uh, general costs, your uh, non-specific costs, administrative and general, and we allocate those based on the O and M expense, uh, excluding purchase power. So we're just creating a, a sort of a general allocation factor for those. Uh, plant in service is allocated using a different set of allocation factors. They are. Uh, largely demand related because most of your plant is distribution plant and those are demand allocation factors. And uh, then we, we create another new allocation factor called uh, depreciable plant value uh, that we use to allocate all the rest of the uh, general plant. The bottom line here is that we get to this summary. Uh, this is where we take the total revenues and the individual class revenues. We subtract 
from the from that the the allocated expenses to come up with net income. We then divide the net income by the allocated plant to come up with a rate of return. The overall rate of return for the fiscal 19 test year was 5%, which is right at the sort of at the bottom range of your 5 to 8% target zone. But the individual class rates are quite a bit more varied. Excuse me, Mayhew, and I want to highlight that. That 5% number is a good number for the entire system. We it collect is. nothing more than we need to to meet the overall statutory rate of return for the entire system. Now, how we got there is, is the detail that needs to be parsed and I don't want to steal Mayhew's thunder, but that's what he's going to talk about next. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, yeah. So you can see that the individual classes vary from a, a minus 9% for residential up to oh, uh, the small small general is like 30, 34%. Uh, in the small municipal, it's a little bit higher, even 36%. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a sizable range. Uh, I would say, let's see, do I say this elsewhere? Or should I say it here? Uh, there is a range of reasonableness that I typically see in uh, public power utility rates. And, and this follows the general pattern, uh, but it's, a, it's a, a little more extreme than I usually see. Residential rates of return are typically zero or slightly below. Uh, because uh, this, uh, as a conventional wisdom, is that the the residents are, in effect, the owners of the utility, and therefore you don't need to earn a profit on them. Uh, and 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 the smaller uh, commercial customers tend to produce a higher rate of return, uh, and usually then the very large customers produce sort of a median rate of return because those are they're important businesses, they're major employers in the community, uh, and they also tend to have more choices. Large, very large customers can uh, oftentimes are part of national corporations that can move their businesses uh, for various reasons. So they have more choices and therefore they tend to get more favorable rate treatment. Um, and I, I, let me just repeat, it's, th this is, it follows the pattern that I usually see, but it's a little more extreme than what I'm used to seeing. Uh, so the, we've determined that the model is accurately calculating revenues from the rates uh, components and the volumes, that it's accurately represented the operating results, and therefore we can use it to analyze forecast rates and operating results that the calculated rates of return vary significantly and the variation is much greater than observed in the previous study. Uh, I, I looked into the previous study with, uh, to a certain uh, level of detail because I was, I, I was concerned about that, that there was such a, a difference in just five years uh, in the rates of return that I was seeing. And the two main explanations that I saw for that is that the previous study used different allocation factors for capacity and transmission uh, than I have used. And, and I don't believe that those were correct. Uh, the, 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 the allocation factors that I've used reflect how those costs, costs are actually being caused by the customers. And those two expenses, capacity and transmission expenses, represent 40% of total operating expenses. So if you change the allocation of those, you can have a significant impact on the rate of return. Uh, and also then, as I discussed, uh, there has really been a shift in the allocation of those costs, as we just discussed with the capacity, that, that those costs are are being allocated on the basis of a much later hour uh, when there's just more 
a, a larger portion of residential contribution sure. than that. Can you hear us? Yep, I can hear you. Did I fade out again? Yeah, yeah. We, we think it's a speaker issue on this end. Tony has to just sort of, you know, bang the tubes. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I'm dating myself, I remember doing that. Uh, <laughs> all right, so so uh, let's see. What was the last thing? What was the last thing you heard then? Yeah, yeah, I'm dating myself. No, where he's asking where. We're oh, um, you had just finished talking about the forty percent and the and the time of day shift. Okay, that was that was all I had to say there. Okay. Uh, it, it, good, good place to stop and see if there's any questions on the historic cost of service. Maybe go back to these numbers and uh, make sure that make sure that everybody understands what's going on here. Yeah, Mayhew, my apologies. I meant to ask a question. You're all the way back on page 25, and I did not. Um, The question was from one of our commissioners who, who couldn't make it this evening, and he, he makes the comment, he suggests that what you show us on page 25, yes, the slide you have on the screen right now, um, suggests that, that we, the utility, should put more effort into, into energy peak load management for the residential class. He acknowledges that that's not a direct rate issue, but something for our conservation load management staff to think about. I don't disagree with that, but um, there's other issues at play there, and I can discuss that with him offline. Then he right. moves on to page 29 and makes the, the observation that page 29 suggests the need to increase revenue from the residential class. He also then incorrectly says, or shift more expenses to the residential class, which is sort of the same thing. If you shift more expenses to a class, you have to collect more revenue from them to be equitable um, for equitable distribution with other classes. And I note that I, I feel that's correct and that he's sort of stealing your thunder a little bit, but towards, towards the end of the presentation, you show in general terms how we might address that. Yes, yeah, and I, and I think we have, uh, we've got a significant opportunity here uh, that 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 can help with that, and we'll talk about that when okay. when we get there. Okay, and that's it for now. Now I'm caught up. Okay. So let's uh, let's move on to the financial projection, 22 through 25. Uh, we started by projecting operating revenues. Uh, we did the same thing that we did in the the individual year cost of service studies, but now we're doing it over a five-year span. We're multiplying the billing determinants by the by the rate elements. Uh, where I have taken the Energy New England uh, load projection, which is also used to generate the purchase power costs, and used that to uh, to increase or decrease sales. So we start with the, the total load that they project. We subtract losses uh, from that to derive total sales. And then we allocate the total sales across the customer classes using fiscal 19. So we're basically saying your proportion of sales by customer class is going to stay pretty much the same. And so if overall sales go up by 1%, then residential goes up by 1% and commercial, etc. So that's all that that says. Uh, we kept all of the we kept all of the existing rate elements constant in the revenue projection except for the the energy charge and the and the PCA and and that's just for for simplicity in modeling uh, we want to try we're, we're going to do some scenario analysis here where we're looking at different rate scenarios for uh, each customer class over a five-year horizon and so to to sort of get control of the data, I'm just varying the energy charge each year uh, to have to take revenues up or down. 
So that's why I'm using ener the energy charge as the input variable for these different scenarios. And then I'm just calculating the PCA each year uh, based on uh, the total cost of power uh, per kilowatt hour minus the, the embedded cost of 9.39 cents. So I'm just calculating a PCA so that so that the increases or decreases in purchase power costs get passed through to the customers through the PCA. And, and then all the other miscellaneous electric revenues, first we normalize them by taking some uh, unusual uh, credits, revenue credits out, and then taking the, the base other revenues and escalating them at a 2% uh, inflation rate. The uh, purchase power expenses were taken from the same energy New England forecast. Uh, other operating expenses we projected from the fiscal 21 budgeted amounts at an escalation rate of 2.6%, which I think reflects your labor agreements. Well, no, uh, if you, for the record, what it does is we got that number from an actuarial report that was provided by the Human Resources Department that came to them from the town's finance department. Thank you. Uh, interest income, we just held constants and other revenues, other interest expenses, other expenses were escalated at 2% from fiscal 21. So that's how we projected out revenues and expenses. Asset value was projected using the five-year capital budget uh, that was provided by the department, uh, and those were spread across uh, each plant account uh, on the basis of, of the increase in the total amount of the capital additions. Uh, depreciation expense was calculated on the basis of total original plant value at an assumed overall depreciation rate of 3%. Uh, based on my analysis of historic depreciation expense relative to net plant over the past few years. And then that depreciation was also allocated to individual plant accounts. And there were no assumptions made about uh, retirements of plant during the period. So those are the assumptions that were made. Uh, so the next thing that we look at is what happens to cash balances over the forecast period. And the calculation shows that the cash remains well above the calculated cash reserve requirement over the period. Uh, as you can see, the ending balance goes from about 31 million to about 34 million, while the minimum stays at about 18 million. So uh, sufficient uh, cash to meet reserve requirements over the period. Yes, uh, that's with regard to the taxes for the 21 budget. Why are they so much higher than, you know, the, why are they 200,000 more than what they are on a going forward basis? Is it part timing or something? Uh, if you're talking five, 564 versus uh, 350 from here on out. I'm sure there's a reason for it. I just don't know what, I just don't know what it is. So. You hear the question, Mayhew? Yeah, I heard the question. Uh, I honestly don't recall. Uh, the, the Again, the, the 564 was from the budget. Uh, I, I seem to recall we had a, either, either a call or an email about those assumptions to, to use going forward. Uh, but I, I don't recall specifically how the 350 was derived for uh, on, on the taxes. Sorry. All right. We'll, we'll have to get back to the commission on that because I'm looking okay. at staff and they can't recall either. Yep. May you, this is Patrick Brady. I got a question for you that I'm sure you'd like to get to, but just help me understand. You know, we, our, our PCA adjustment. Uh, Language. Our PCA, for example, over the last six months has, has taken a hit, has hit cash reserves. Our, our cash reserve number has gone down as a result of our PCA adjustment that's set. But there is no kind of, there's no um, 
attention in your cash reserve calculation to the impact that PCA may have on minimum cash reserve requirements, and, and why is that? Well, it, it, I mean, in theory, the, the PCA is 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 self-funding and self-reconciling. So if there are if there are shortfalls, uh, those get recovered when the PCA is adjusted. Uh, so I, I don't think the PCA really affects cash. It, well, it shouldn't certainly shouldn't affect cash balances in the long run. Maybe may, if I can just chime in real quick. In the past, a couple of years back, when we were sort of artificially reducing the PCA to zero to offset those that capacity help, we were drawing down cash at that point. But when we're not doing that, when we're letting the PCA naturally fall when it shall, then like maybe you said, it's sort of the even one. Not the other. No long term impact on cash. Yeah, okay. And that's right, it was the capacity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. That, then at that point in time, we were correct, drawing down cash to have them here. Yeah, okay, thank you. Good, okay. Uh, so we then uh, built a cost of service calculation in the financial projection so that we can allocate the uh, energy capacity transmission and distribution expenses and plant and service, uh, we took those allocation factors from the fiscal 22 detailed cost of service model and moved them into the five-year forecast model to produce a, a, a pretty good approximation of the cost of service that lets us look at, at, at general trends in rate of return over a five-year period uh, w without making the modeling excessively complicated. Excuse me, Mayhew? Yes. Just real quick, I'll make a note. We got about 30 minutes. Okay, yeah. yes. I I have been keeping my eye on uh, on, on the clock. But. Okay, thank you. So, and, and we're actually, you know, we're fairly close to the finish line here because uh, we're getting into the into the rate scenarios. Uh, so the first thing that we did is basically as a base case is, is to look at what happens if we just keep the present rates in place, uh, the PCA uh, passes back any savings in purchase power costs to the customers, and, and, and we're, you know, what happens to the rate of return. And fiscal 21 is fine, it produces a 6% rate of return. Uh, but the the net income uh, really is 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 not uh, isn't sustainable because it it ref reflects some large one time revenue credits. Uh, if when we take those out, when we normalize the uh, the the other revenues, the overall rate of return falls to a, a negative two point two percent in fiscal twenty two and continues to fall and 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 that's because uh purchase power costs are going down but your distribution costs your 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 cost of owning and operating system are going up and they're going up faster than sales are so anytime that that happens your 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 income is getting eroded during that period though uh customer bills are still going down every year uh because of declining power costs and, and and that's really the key to this the path forward. This is what it looks like uh, up in the upper left hand corner. We're looking at individual class rates of return that are you know 20 to 30 percent for the non-residential classes and minus uh, really getting down into almost minus 12, 13 percent for the residential classes. Uh, 750 kilowatt hour residential bill just goes down and down and down and then eases up again at the end because purchase power costs are starting to increase. And the same thing with the average rate for all classes, they're all pretty much going down uniformly and then a little nudge up at the end when purchase power costs start to increase again. Uh, comparison with Eversource, uh, uh, not really any comparison. You are you're much much lower than Eversource for every class, and you know lo, n not as much lower in residential as you are in the small 
uh, classes, but uh, you know, it's a substantial competitive advantage. End of story. Now, uh, maybe just just to repeat and emphasize, this is if we did nothing. Correct? This is that's right. These are the present rates continued for, for five years. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So then we looked at uh, where would we like to go, and we looked at it. We we actually looked at several scenarios, but uh, but this is the one that seemed the most attractive, uh, and that is to maintain an overall rate of return of at least 5%, to try to raise the residential rate of return to zero by fiscal 25, to get the non-residential rates of return under 20% over that same time period. And this is kind of an arbitrary number, but to avoid increases of more than 5% a year for any customer, any group of customers. And we think we've accomplished this. Uh, the results are that the, are, they're showing an overall rate of return between five and a half and six and a half percent, which is above the minimum. Uh, the residential rate of return gets to zero by fiscal 25. The non-residential rates of return go be, between 10 percent for the primary and 19 for small general. And nobody's has an annual increase from year to year of more than five percent uh and this is all because you have because of the declining purchase power cost you're able to uh basically not lower the residential rates but not increase it either while at the same time that you're lowering the non-residential rates in order to get those rates of return down and you can really see how the top rates of return decline while the residential goes up. And you end up with something that much more closely resembles uh, at least the public power norm uh, of rates of return, somewhere, you know, somewhere between zero and, uh, and less than 20%. Yes. Uh, the top left graph on what is your page 40, which is what's on the screen now, to me, this is the one that shows the results of your labor. The, the, the gathering of the rates of return by fiscal 25, where they're all comparable, there's the word I was looking for, or more comparable to each other than they were before. And again, this gets back to, to me the, the power of the individual rate class rates of return and calculating them and illustrating them. I, I, th this was the novel concept to me. Keep coming back to it because to me it's, it's, the, it's the big value in, in what we've done here. Um, but, but Mr. Hendershaw, I just, I just want to refresh my recollection. You were advocating uh, equity in the rates five years ago. You, yes. you may not have fashioned the concept of this rate of return right. concept, right. but you clearly advocated five years ago equity amongst the rate payers. Correct. So that's not different than it was five no, years No, no, the, the goal isn't different, but I think this analysis You're does a better sure. job of, of demonstrating where the numbers are. It's a different way to get to the same place. Yes, but we're, like we're, well, we're still trying to get to where we, we didn't get to five years ago or 10 years ago. I wasn't here 10 years ago, but Correct. I certainly remember the rate making process five years ago. Correct. I remember you sitting across the table with Mr. Adair advocating the same position you're advocating now. It's a little different. It's a little spin on how we get there, but it's the same concept. Oh, you want to make sure that instead of Instead of residential rate payers having a, a negative 9% um, return on investment, um, you want them closer to zero. You want some, you want some equity. You want to make sure all the rate payers are essentially carrying their own load based on their usage. Yes. Which, Bob here, which is a little bit different than the concept that was used previous, previously, because what, what was done both 10 years ago and five years ago primarily was looking at the customer charge in terms of the basic 
the basic cost to have a customer. And this is why the customer charges went up. That that was that's just that was one component of it. Is it? But that is what that is one of the primary things uh, that was looked at the last two rate cases. This is a this is a totally different view of how it's being looked at. And I think overall it's a, you know it is fairer to all the classes involved. Uh, let's see. Any, any other questions on this? Let's see. What do we got next here? Uh, so let's just walk through uh, the uh, one at a time the the rates and and how they play out over time. And and I want to emphasize here that that at this point all of the change in rates is here in the energy charge. Uh, that's that's not to say that that's where it needs to be uh what we're the real important factor here are these percent changes uh we within the context of a two percent change or a 111 dollars three cent bill we can increase or decrease the customer charge and increase or decrease the energy charge and similarly when we get to the customers with demand rates we can shift costs there at this point, in order to reduce the number of moving parts, uh, this is the moving part. Uh, and then this is basically this is the input up here, this is the output down here. Uh, and so what we're looking at is a uh, an increase in each year in the residential energy charge combined with a decrease in the PCA which allows the bill to stay the same right up until the point where the PCA stops decreasing because purchase power costs have started to edge back up again. And I also need to emphasize this is this is entirely based on forecasts of purchase power costs. And it's probably important to revisit this every year uh, as we go forward to make sure that we're still working in the same cost environment that we are right now. And so then there's a similar situation here. Small general, the, the bill goes down a little bit every year, one, two, three percent, and then finally nudges up by one percent. Uh, large general service uh, goes down three percent, three percent, four percent, and then edges up 2%, and the primary uh, also down 3, 0, down 1, and then finally up 5. But they then, you know, they end, they end up in this place uh, where they're all, these are all significantly lower than they are now, and this is significantly higher. So, You've evened that out. You've created that equity among the classes. That's that's a little problematic right now. And that's pretty much it from me. Uh, so questions and feedback, I think, uh, are are the next uh, next order. Well, Mayhew, you uh, just to make sure everyone understands, as you you noted earlier. You know, this is more the the revenues required per class, and the details the, the details of the rates have yet to be worked out. The exact charges that will produce these revenues and therefore these these typical bills. That's right. Uh, now that said, given the relatively small changes from year to year here, uh, there's probably not a whole lot of need to fine tune it any more than this. Uh, it, this is this is pretty much fine tuning. You can also, as we discussed earlier, you can also fine tune some of these uh, changes year to year, so that maybe even mitigate some of the last year increase by having less of a decrease in the previous year. Uh, we could we can do a little fine tuning with that as well, as long as we as as long as we end up where where we want to be. Thank you.
Bob, Jeffrey, you got yeah, anything? I was going to say, if anybody has, if anybody has any questions, comments, uh, please. Yes, sir. Yeah, just, just uh, uh, map, understanding the map on the PCA. So um, on page 42, Mayhew, there, we're, we're ultimately getting to our, our bill, our 70, 750 kilowatt hour bill from an, a reduction or uh, a decrease of the, in the PCA, correct? How did you correct. perform the PCA number from fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 25? Like, how did you calculate that number? So that number is calculated by taking the total purchase power costs as forecast by Energy New England, dividing it by the total kilowatt hour sales, also as forecast by Energy New England, and subtracting from that the base power cost that's embedded in the rates, 9.39 cents. Uh, and so the, the difference is the PCA, either a charge or a credit. So if the average cost of purchase power is more than 9.39 cents, then there will be a charge for the PCA. And if the average cost of power is less than 9.39 cents, then there's a credit. Got it. And you, and you did state a minute or two ago that based on the forecast, the PCA through the period is going to be negative, but we got to check every year to make sure that's the case. Right. And, and what's happening there is that uh, – uh, forward capacity costs are going down over the next uh, four years. Uh, transmission costs are going up, but not quite as fast as capacity costs are going down. Eventually, you get to fiscal 25. Uh, we don't know what capacity costs are going to be, uh, at least for half of that year. So uh, right now, people are expecting them to go up. We'll see. Uh, this also, of course, assumes en energy costs are low, and I think also you may have some fixed, uh, relatively higher cost fixed hedges that are rolling off uh, over the next couple of years, uh, which which allow costs to go down. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Uh... No, I mean, Tony and I and Matt and Brian have seen this and been crawling all over Mayhew about no, it. Right. It's it's several well, days. Just, so. No, I was just thinking, if there's anything you, you wanted to add, oh. that's, that's much better. No, I think not. Go ahead. It's, a, it's a good story well told. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Mayhew. Um, <laughs> um, you know, the, the news is largely good. There's nothing too dramatic happening. I think it's been a good refresh uh, of the uh, of the division taking a look at itself financially seeing where its needs are where the re what the revenues are and what the results are and um, not, not, nothing in the way of bad news or big surprises and, um, and I think you know most mostly good news well it's a, it's a nice opportunity that you have to be in a in a declining cost uh, environment where you can do creative things with race that you really would not be able to do uh, if costs were going up. So yeah, it's, a, it's an opportunity you probably want to take advantage of. Don't disagree. Out of curiosity, and this is, this is looking out further, uh, and this is probably more directly toward you at this point. Uh, what are we seeing as far as energy prices in the out years? And I'm looking toward maybe 25, 26 at this point. Yeah, doing? I don't even know that the forward curves are showing anything for 26 yet. 25. Um, maybe. Well, I. I mostly look at it as for variability. Mm -hmm. We try to, for lack of better words, try to say, you know, to time it. You know, when, when does it look like a good a good time to talk to EME &E and Craig about um, is it time for a purchase? And we're actually looking next week. Mm -hmm. We might be looking to buy. And um, 
um, and we'll start to layer some in from out that far. Or we'll look at it, we'll shop it anyway, we'll see what the price is. My, 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 my gut feeling is I think we're going to see, start seeing some of this going back up some. Um, in my personal opinion, but I mean, that's, that's just based all on the what out, I see. All the out years are higher than the close are in. I think that's that's always been the case. I think there's Generally. a big uncertainty factor in that. Everybody hedges the prices further out because you don't know. If you're promising to deliver power at a certain price, mm -hmm. you want a little more cushion in case things turn south on you. Over the next yeah, there's, and th there's not a lot of, as, as you said, Rick, there's not a lot of liquidity in the market out beyond 25. Uh, yeah. So it, it, it gets, yeah, it's a little trickier, but I, I, I have clients who are locking in volumes 10 years out now because there's, there are suppliers out there who are willing to, to do that in this, at, at this moment. And, you know, who knows, but, but to have some position out that far, uh, is is an attractive proposition. I hope they're not trying to move gas through the Suez Canal. Um, <laughs> I I understand that that's uh, that they've uh, man managed to get some get, get some X lax in there and get break it loose. They got that boat out of the way, did they really? They did. Yeah. It was Dutchmen. They got all oh, the Dutch showed up. <laughs> all right. There's nothing else. Uh, give a close, closing workshop. I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. I'll second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. All right. We stand adjourned at uh, 1947. Maybe. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. you very much. You did a heck of a you know, I'm concerned you've done a heck of a, a job looking at it from a different point of view than we ever had before. So uh, appreciate it very much. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. I uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to present this, and maybe someday we'll be able to do it in person. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I look forward to that too, Mayhew. All right. All right. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you.